so uh, we are back with the second panel. Um, and uh, we are focusing this time on uh, growing and protecting Chicago's black cultural geographies. Um, I want to say this is our first panel um, was really looking in a lot of ways as kind of a, a kind of um, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s uh, uh, kind of black uh, social culture in Chicago. Um, and this panel, though it might, it might also delve uh, into some of that um, mid-century, 20th century uh, cultural history is really looking at some of the more contemporary phenomenons <clears throat> of black social culture in Chicago. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our moderator once again and give it to Mario then to um, introduce our panelists and get into the conversation. So uh, Mario Smith is the host uh, and executive producer of News from the service entrance uh, on uh, Lumpen Radio in Chicago. Uh, the host of the Silver Room's randomly selected podcast and the uh, co-host of the podcast, uh, Who You Get with Mark, uh, Mike and Mario. His poetry has appeared in the books Power Lines, a decade of poetry from Chicago's Guild Complex and The Breakbeat Poets, published by Haymarket Press. And he was featured in the Chicago Readers, the, People issue, the People's Issue in 2022. So I'm gonna give it up now to Mario to ha get us into the second discussion. There we go. Even my voice changes when I talk into a microphone. <laughs> How is everyone? Good, good. We're, we're going to um, have a very robust conversation about uh, a lot of things, including gatekeeping um, and why it's important, uh, as it was mentioned in the first panel, to be certain to put yourself in a position to give this to the future folks and the current people who are interested in doing things like we do, because if we don't, then it goes away. And, or it is in the hands of someone who isn't responsible enough and then it just is something weird. And you're like, why am I here? This, isn't, this doesn't do anything to feed me, I should go. <laughs> um, but we'll have that conversation. I'm not gonna ask the big question. I will let one of you all ask Eric. I'm not doing it. You'll figure it out as we go along. From uh, the far right, one of you, everybody knows the question. From the far right, <laughs> one of the best DJs in Chicago. She is an amazing human being. She is a far better person than she is a DJ, and she is one great DJ, Celeste Alexander. All right, so look. Uh, I, I've known Pugs a long time, and this, this, uh, this edition of Pugs is an incredible addition. The Inglewood Arts Collective is a dope organization and he's a big part of what they're doing. His artwork is phenomenal. And if you know, you know, he's one of the also one of the best rappers in town. A uh, really talented man, Pugs Adams. Right, uh, Eric Williams is the leader of the band. He is the founder of Silver Room and co uh, founder of Bronzeville Winery. He was responsible for 16 years of the best time I've ever had on a stage. Well, I did 16 of them, so those other two don't count. 18 years of the Silver Room Block Party, and uh, a, 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 an amazing dude, Eric Williams. Um, I'm only reading from the paper because I don't want to mess Alexi up, and we just kind of met. Um, like. 10 minutes ago, that's true, we were just met. Uh, Alexi Young is the founder of Art West, a creative consultant and art practitioner. She blends visual arts, curation, film, and storytelling to impact creative engagement within Chicago communities and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexi Young. All right. And our program tonight will be closed out by uh, a dope DJ, man, Control Zora out here, smacking people in the head, and it's, it's a wonderful thing Control Zora, y'all. Give her some. Uh, okay. 
Uh, I'm going to stand up at some point like Kahari because this seat is low. This is definitely a church. I will be very mindful of that through the course of our conversation. Um, but I, I've, got, I've got four questions. Um, and by the way, it will be the questions. We'll look at the artifacts, and then we'll open it up for questions from you. Please, please, please ask these great people questions. Um, so I'll just, uh, there we go. I'm always getting in trouble. Are we guilty of cultural gatekeeping in Chicago? And whoever would like to take that question first can. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's what I would say really got me to want to be in charge of my destiny and making music and throwing events and, you know, having a marketing company and then, you know, having my own clothing, you know, all those things, just because so much of it was like, if you didn't grow up with us or you didn't go to this high school, you're out. You know, it was very, very much cliquish. But on the other side, I felt like it made people better, where you had to be really great to get the microphone. And you knew when they passed it, oh my gosh, this, I see why you're headlining. You know, whereas now it kind of, people are in their own world and can kind of just jump a lot of steps because you could YouTube it, you know. Easier to skip working hard. Well, building it, like truly building it. Like when you truly build it, you could go anywhere and do it. Whereas if it's skimmed over, it's maybe, it's like a chance of rain. Celeste, I know you're gonna say it, go on. Most definitely. And um, personally, not knowing that's what I was doing, um, I'm very guilty of it. Um, I think that, at least in the, the house music community, um, Chicago DJ culture, I think um, a lot of the things that we have and don't have socially in Chicago um, kind of makes us wanna hold on to whatever it is that we have been able to get and be real selfish with it and don't want to pass it on because it's, we feel like it's all we have as far as our acclaim. Um, I think that the political landscape of Chicago as I have known it over the last 60 years has always been segregated competition um, and eat dog eat. Um, and I think that's kind of the way we were raised that, and we've passed that along generationally. And um, you'll kind of get to a point where there were such good times at a specific point that we don't have that anymore. So all we have is the memory of it and we want to hold on to the memory of it and stake a claim and say it has to remain this way. And I think that's what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, the gatekeepers want to keep it the way it was, but the world evolves, the culture evolves, the music evolves, um, people die off new people come in, the only thing that's um, constant is the change of it. And it's real hard sometimes for some people to say, it's okay to change, it's okay to grow. They don't wanna recognize it because that might speak a little bit to their own mortality. And um, who wants to speak to their own mortality, you know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, there's definitely um, a gatekeeper type of mentality throughout all of our social cultures, generationally, in the city of Chicago, but I think that's just a part of what Chicago is, and it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's kind of great, but kind of sucks at the same time. Yeah. I kind of agree a little bit with what Pug was saying. Um, gatekeeping is a big, it's a big term, it could mean a lot of different things. But 
I think what you were saying, and I kind of agree with this, is that you know when we started doing what we were doing back in the 80s, it was like um, a rite of passage, right? Like you couldn't just DJ back in the day. Like you kind of had to you know, carry records at first and carry crates and then learn and practice, practice, practice before you got on the tables, you know. Um, there was two guys who pretty much were like the, the idols that, you know, that I had and we had, you know, and you kind of aspired to be these people. So you didn't just start DJing just because it was a fad, you know what I mean? So I feel like, you know, you had to be a, um, a certain level of ex excellence before you did any kind of art. And as an art curator, yeah, you want to give people opportunities and chances, but at the same time, you want to have a certain level of excellence also, because what you're doing is actually for the, for the public. And you want to make sure that you're putting out a good product. So, you know, if somebody's art is not there yet, maybe it's not their time. So I don't see it as gatekeeping. I see it as let's have a certain standard of art, of excellence that we're going to put out there, be it somebody's a DJ, somebody's a visual artist, whatever it is. So, um, and also I, I think because at the time you had people who were, I'm thinking like, you know, 80s, 90s, um, people who understood what, what excellence was. You know, there was a certain, um, Certain way you would see something, you know, we knew that Frankie Knuckles was, was a great DJ. We knew that was not disputed, right? You knew that, you know, Ron Hardy was great. So these were people that you kind of looked at as, as the, the, um, the, 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 the height of their craft. You knew that Basquiat was a great, you know what I'm saying, whatever it was. I think now it's a little bit different because everyone has access to do everything. Everybody just does everything, which I don't necessarily think that because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. So now you can't even determine and, 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 and tell who's good or not because everyone's doing everything. So I think some type of gatekeeping is actually not a bad thing. You need sometimes people to kind of help to say, hey, look, this person isn't ready yet. Let's make sure that these people who actually have you know, been doing this for a while have a certain level of, of talent or quality have a chance to kind of shine. So. That's kind of how I see it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi again, Alexi here. Um, so the way that I experience gatekeeping, it might be a little bit like, you know, different, but <clears throat> I would consider for myself and my experience being a creative uh, who was raised on the west side of Chicago, um, I felt that gatekeeping was more so a, an issue of capitalism and access. Um, so, you know, if I was looking for a place to host an event um, because I wanted to, to gather people, then, you know, how much does it cost? You know, how much can I afford? What, is, what, would, what would be the budget to, you know, um, curate certain experiences. And because there was a scarcity of spaces or accessible spaces for people like me, um, who is an artist who wants to be in a certain kind of vibe in a certain kind of place with certain kind of people, um, I felt like I didn't always want to have to travel to the South Side. Although I've learned so much from the South Side. Like Art West was birthed through my experiences on the South Side. But being raised on the West Side, I felt like you know, I have to travel <laughs> miles from here to like go and connect with people who look or, you know, remind me of myself in some ways. And I didn't know how to connect with, you know, the artists and uh, creatives that were on the west side of Chicago. But I knew in my small community, I felt like there was not a whole lot of access to space because of infrastructure. We really just didn't have a whole lot of space. Um, and that still continues to be a problem. But when I think about gatekeeping, I think about a larger issue, like, um, again, capitalism. Because if people are coming to the party, do I have to charge them? How do I make money? How do I save like time? And it becomes more of uh, a resource issue, more so than um, is anybody trying to hold me back from being great, if that makes sense. OK, this is where I get up, because sitting down stuff is ridiculous. I'm just going to get up to walk over here and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. You know, I do what I can, Kari. Um, yes, I know. I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not that comfortable where I just start acting wild in a church. I know my place. Um, you all are responsible for some big events that have happened in the city. 
And I don't know how to put this any other way than the, it has to be not just financially taxing, but it has to be spiritually taxing. But there's a necessity in many ways for these things to actually happen so that people can commune, they can see art, they can see how it's done, et cetera. Um, if you could just briefly speak on the importance of, of making sure that we, black people in Chicago, leave our mark during this time, um, how important is that? From a curator, from a curatorial standpoint, how important is it that we leave our mark? I know it's archiving, and I know it's documenting as well. But I mean, the actual events themselves. How important is it that we do these? I think it's super key. Just in the sense of like, all these people came together for this thing, and this moment happened. And if it's not recorded, it is word of mouth. But then what happens when the word of mouth passes on? And with a lot of Chicago's history, it's an oral history. And that's where it gets very difficult because if you weren't there or didn't have somebody that was there or a relative, you really don't have an ideal of it. So you can't really honor it because you just didn't know. I mean, for instance, about 2020, right before the pandemic, I wrote a book about my whole crew, crew of 200 kids. So this is everyone from Hebrew Brantley and Max Sam Singh to Open Mike Eagle, so I want to set all these kids that I put together when I was in high school and just our exploits to about, what was that? 2003, but so many kids that were coming to Iridium to shop, because I wouldn't tell them what I, you know, other stuff I did, because I need you to buy the clothes, I'm not try to talk about rap. They would be like, oh my gosh, so it's just like people were out here trying to get their tapes, and they were like going to these basement parties, you know, but that was their only frame of it, because there's no documentary that really detailed it. So from that point, I really started to implore all my friends and other artists I looked up to visually, musically, et cetera, like, yo, you gotta write the book, you gotta get this kid that will do the documentary for you and just give up the goods. So more history can be recorded and we could really have solid documentation in the sense of a New York or a LA where you know where the things came from. Can you uh, repeat the question? Okay, because I totally forgot it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, how important is it that we document these things and, and put these events on for our community and, and, and give folks a chance to actually commune? Okay, so I think that for, for me and Art West, when I, uh, so I'm gonna, cause this is a two part question. So the first question is how important is it to curate or create space? So the idea at the time in 2019 was how can I create more space for creative people on the west side specifically? And I decided I needed to do some research. How do you gather people? I know black folks love food, right? <laughs> I know we love music. I, you know, so I started to do an assessment of all the things that I know has to be a part of this experience. Um, and so I went to the Bronzeville um, trolley tour and it was the first time I had ever gone. And I was like, what? Why we don't do this? And then I went back to the West Side and I was like, well, we really don't have spaces. But then I was like, we, it's not that we don't have spaces. You have to discover the beauty of the West Side, the infrastructure of the West Side, isn't necessarily set up in a way that visibility makes it simple and easy for people to access space. Um, there is a perception that the West Side, ain't, West Side ain't got no grass, right? So there's this whole fear around like entering thresholds on the West Side. So I was like, I need to go find the spaces because I know they're here, even if they're hiding behind a, an abandoned building. Um, we have some amazing spaces and some amazing people doing some incredible work, and they've been doing incredible work for years before I even arrived to this space, right? And so um, at the time, I said, all we need to do is invite people to come inside instead of driving by or passing through, right? So I found, uh, two art galleries on the west side. I was like, what, we got galleries out here, y'all? Um, so it was legendary, legendary art gallery, uh, Philippe Funderburg, 
and then Corey Williams, 345 Art Gallery. And then at the time, I was um, the director at the MLK Exhibit Center on 16th and Hamlin, which is where Dr. King posted up in an apartment in the 60s when he was here fighting for housing equality and so on. I was like, boom, I got three spaces. We're going to create a tour, we're going to invite our friends, and we're going to have a good old West Side time. And I knew I needed money, right? So I decided to pitch this to people who I thought had money, and it turns up I made like, I brought in like $10,000. And I was like, okay, we're going to do this. And why was it important? It was important because so many West Siders that I had known at the time all we did was go to the South Side for everything. But when it came down to partying and, and gathering and doing things on the West Side, we would go to each other's house. We would go kick it at the yard or the barbecue, or the, you know what I'm saying? So we would go to the park. <laughs> people talk about why does the West Side, people are always standing outside. That's because that's where we kicking it at. That's where the party is. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I felt like it was important for people to see, number one, we do have space, we do have places to support, and number three, um, it is important to, to start to curate and rebrand the West Side experience. And in order to do that, people have to come into these spaces and see who's here, and to realize that we do have a very strong, robust, creative um, culture on the west side. So that was the importance at the time. How can I shift the perspective and the perception of what happens here? Because people just pretended that they didn't know, right? Or they didn't know. Um, the second part of the question is um, archiving. So at the time, um, I wrote up the proposal, hosted the event, and I made sure that we had a photographer. So having your creative ecosystem um, present when you are curating these experiences, you have to capture them, and it's an opportunity to put money in other people's hands, right? Like, circulate the dollar. So, if I'm doing something, I'm gonna invite my videographer friend, I'm gonna invite my DJ friend, I'm, everybody that I know is doing something. What you doing? What you, you make a potato salad? You sell cupcakes? What we doing, right? So, um, just making sure that we capture that, because that in itself, even if you only host one event, and even if it is two or three people there, you gather those people in that corner and you take a picture and you make sure that picture looks like the whole place was full, and boom, you got a proof of concept. And that is the reason why I think Art West was able to build some traction, because we did one thing really well one time, and we captured it, and that was the proof of concept. So that was, that's my answer. It was a long answer, but I hope it was <laughs> helpful. No, no, that's a big thing. Like in spaces where they don't have, you know, event spaces, like with Inglewood, one of our biggest things with the Inglewood Arts Collective was like, how can we make you see it desirable, but also make the neighbors enjoy it in a way where it's theirs as well. So I mean, like our first big thing in that sense we did we just went out and put up all these like picket signs that said envision this could be a dance center, this vacant lot, this could be a bank, this vacant lot, this could be a place to help you with your homework, et cetera, et cetera. And then from there, it graduated to taking over an abandoned gas station and creating like a free market with alt space where people could bring stuff and take stuff, but then a playground for the kids in the art sense of a playground. And then from there, how can we change the viaduct? You know, just using the spaces you have to create yeah, the events. You know, I'm listening to both of you all, and thank you for that. Um, it just gave me an overall um, feeling of realizing and recognizing how resourceful we really are as a people. Um, but we have to realize that we're, real, re, we're resourceful as a people. Um, it's been generationally the way we've been able to survive, making something out of nothing. Um, the same way mama could take a chicken and, 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 and feed 15 kids, 
um, making something out of nothing. Um, we have to realize that we have that resourcefulness in us. It's innate. Um, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it was given to us. It was, we were raised in it. And then collaboration. Um, we have to get past our own fears of each other. Um, I'm from the south side. My husband is from the west side. I'm from High Park. <laughs> I'm about to say some real bougie stuff right now, though. I never thought in my life I would ever be married to a man that was born and raised on the west side and that I would live six years on 16th and Millard. And the culture shock of that was, was something else, because I'm from High Park, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Um, resourcefulness. I have never in my life seen a vacant lot party before. But living on the west side, I remember one day going to work. I worked second shift, going to work, and I saw them cleaning the vacant lot on the corner of 15th and Millard. They were cleaning a lot. And I was like, oh, isn't that nice? They're cleaning up the vacant lot, the glass, and all that other stuff. When I got off work at 11 o'clock and came back, there was a full-blown outdoor club going on on that vacant lot. I mean, they had the bar set up. They had the photographer out there with the big canvas that looked like the curvy steps. They had a dance floor down. They was out there stepping. I was, I would, I said, they had a vacant lot party. And they went until like three o'clock in the morning getting down. I was so impressed by that. I was like, how recent? They bought a dance floor out. Look, they had a wooden floor. We, we in house music. We not giving up wooden dance floors for nobody. If we doing an outdoor event, you just got to dance in the grass and take your chances, right? But y'all, they had a full parquet wooden dance floor out. And the women were in their pumps and in their dresses as if they were down the street at what was the, at mothers, what, brothers, mothers, brothers, it was a separate, it was a, it was a place out here on the west side where I used to come when I was younger, I would venture to the west side just to go stepping, right? But it was an outdoor, full-blown club, complete with dance floor, bar, photographer, anything you, it was the most resourceful thing I had ever seen in my life. But I didn't think of it then as being resourceful, right? I was like, dang, the West Side is, wow. You know, I had never seen anything like that before. But it speaks to our resourcefulness. And if we have a desire to do anything, all we have to do is get past our fears of doing it collectively gather ourselves as resources and put forth an effort and an idea. And whether people come or not, that within itself is successful. Okay. Uh, and, and this, you can definitely address this question. Uh, how important is it that we create these cultural moments and these, these community moments for our people, how important is it? Well, of course it's important. Um, for me, I think about um, the times that I had a good time and mostly going back to me as a kid. That's kind of where most things I do come from. Like the block party was from a, a block party that I had when I was you know, a kid, you know? And you think about the most, the most, most times we have fun is actually in very informal spaces, right? Either in church, uh, on the porch, you know, on the corner, you know, somebody's basement, somebody's kitchen. I mean, these are usually informal spaces. So that's kind of what I was thinking about when I was thinking about trying to create a block party, which was really bringing people together from different parts of our culture who I actually met in the store who didn't know each other, you know. So maybe this one person is a dancer, this other person is a singer, this other person 
is in the hip hop. The other person lives on a hundred and you know, 50 something in Harvey, whatever, you know what I mean? But how do you bring these people together using uh, music, arts, and culture in a very informal sense? And you know, to me, it's better in many ways because it kind of takes your guard down when you're not, you know, when you don't have to dress a certain way, have to look a certain way, kind of just kind of come a as you are. So I think that's kind of how we've always kind of done, you know, through our culture, and it was very informal. And it's also, the other part of that question is, you know, this is just my opinion, you know, we don't always document things because we're too busy having enjoying it. You know what I mean? So I think you look back. You know, I was reading this. I was in New York this past week in the Harlem uh, Renaissance. Uh, they had this big exhibit at the Met, and they documented, you know, a lot of uh, the talks they were having. You know, and then the artists. You know, but a lot of it didn't get documented because they were so ingrained. They were so busy talking about it and enjoying it. They weren't thinking about. It. I mean, now it's very different because everyone is a journalist now. Everyone has a way to document something. So I think there's pros and cons of that. But trying to find footage from like old house parties, trying to find footage is actually difficult um, because the technology wasn't there, number one. But I think also we were just trying to have a good time. We weren't thinking about let's encapsulate this, like let's, you know, uh, let's take this for the future generations. We weren't really thinking about that. We were thinking like, let me just have a good time, you know. Now in hindsight, we look back, okay, we should have had more, you know, this recorded, or, you know, for, you know, you know, for for a future, for the future, but I think at the time we weren't really thinking about that. So now we can, you know, document things, we can package it and, you know, make it look pretty to, you know, for prosperity, not prosperity, to, for, for, to make it, not just in the moment that we want to, like, uh, market this event, but also to document it for future gen generations to see this is, what's ha this is what happened in 2024, whatever year it was, so. I will quickly speak to uh, a couple of years ago in Inglewood. <clears throat> right around toward the end of the pandemic. Um, myself and some other folks who I can't mention because it's a clandestine organization. <laughs> we brought Hank Willis Thomas's Afro pick to Inglewood. And we had you know, an event with it, Corey Wilkes played. Um, it was a marketplace and all that. But the, the idea of bringing that pick there when we were all gone, people were still gravitating toward it. And that was so important. Our purpose for doing that was, this is going to be the thing that gets people outside to look up and go, oh wow, that's a big pick. And we should, we should be thinking about what the symbolism behind that Afro pick meant or means in, in its present time. And it's one of the best things I've ever been a part of, being able to do that. A little piece, but you know. No, I mean, that's a very important thing because now there's gonna be a big black fist yep. sculpture taking the place and that you guys absolutely. earmarked for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I want to add something real quick. I think part of it too was why we didn't document things was because there was like a fear of missing out. You know, that it's like you were at this party, man, you should have been there. It's all verbal. You know, we were talking about these things. Like, you know, now you can film a party and somebody who's not there could actually see it. It's not the same as being there, you know? Yeah. Even how we play records, you know, you've, you know, you, you know, you DJ, you know, you, you blank the record out. You put some tape over the name, you take a marker because you didn't want anybody to know what you were playing. <laughs> so I think now we've gotten to a culture where we want everybody to know what we're doing. So it's kind of shifted. Again, I, I'm, as you see, I'm kind of nuanced usually most things, but I think there's pros and cons to that. You know, Maybe, you, maybe um, this idea that everybody sees everything all the time isn't necessarily a good thing. Yeah. I love that you are talking about that because I feel like amongst um, my peers, we've there's been more conversation about exclusive experiences where it's like no phones, you know, like device free experiences because people are so inundated with constantly being plugged into the robust and the bustling and the movement of, of everywhere all the time that we actually are craving more intimacy. So I think that that is going to be the next wave of um, what people are going to be seeking out, you because, know, quiet time and quality time with good people. Because people make assumptions that they should have access to everything. Mm -hmm. I think you shouldn't have access to everything, actually. Yeah. So you should have access to see what's going on here. It's like, no, if you want to see what's going on here, you got to actually come here. Right. Yep. Or you know be a mean? part of it. Or be a part of it, right. right. So I think with technology, it's actually made things not as important in some ways. Oh, I can see this later. I can look at this TV. You know, before it's like I had to be in front of TV at 8 o'clock to see this video, That's period. Right. You know, it wasn't no, I can see this later on YouTube, blah, blah. So I, I feel like in some ways it actually made things um, more disposable. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the Lit X era. That was a beautiful time. It was man. a great time, right? I would be there faithfully every <laughs> Thursday, man. It was a great time. We have very little documented anything of it outside of a couple of uh, sign-up lists, which are the names on the sign-up list are crazy because these are all people who are famous now, like big, famous folk who was just coming, hanging out, smoking BDs, kicking it down at Silver Room, kicking at Sorrells. <laughs> but that was like a second city. For yeah, like poets, rappers, and that's kind of speaking to that. Kendall Lloyd, who owned uh, Lit X, always said everybody felt safe in Wicker Park because they didn't have to worry about whatever they were doing, wherever else they were from. They would come to Wicker Park because they knew they could be safe. I, I, I mention that because there, I found, I guess about maybe two or three months ago, on YouTube, just kind of moseying around. There's a big film that someone was making, some project they were making a documentary or whatever, and they've got all of Triple X, and they got the Literary Explosion sign, the first one, and they got Kendall and Anne Marie in the store, and then you can see how the store used to look when it was first built. That idea of being able to say, that really did happen, it's not just me telling you it happened. And then I think about hanging out at the music box, Ron Hardy letting us stay when our boy had left us, and <laughs> we needed to not be on Lower Wacker Drive kicking it. We needed to be somewhere safe. And he reluctantly let us in and played for us for like an hour and a half. I, we didn't have a phone to go, look at this. It's just we, we were in the moment. And there have been so many in the moment things, um, which leads to my final question before we open it up for the audience. The, this panel is called Growing and Protecting Chicago's Black Cultural Geographies. My question is, how do we properly execute that? They pay me to ask the questions. Well, <laughs> one more time. How do we properly execute growing and protecting Chicago's black cultural geographies? Uh, I think one of the things we need is space, which is number one. Hey. <laughs> and I think, and who was talking about in the last panel, somebody talk, talk, talked about the, the space ownership. Was that somebody mentioned that? About the fact that we don't own any spaces, basically. Mm-hmm. And so um, the last panel, was they, they were asking about uh, how things change and house music, and I, I remember back in the early 90s when, uh, when Ron Hardy died and I think Frankie had moved back to, to New York, um, there was no spaces really to go. And so all the nightclubs, all the clubs had closed. And so, you know, um, when the shelter opened up, the shelter here in Chicago, which was a white-owned club that kind of took a lot of black culture, and they, they monetized our culture in many ways, and we weren't part of that, you know? So, you know, that's why I've tried to have space into the day. I mean, it could be something simple, you know? So you have to have ownership of space to be able to tell your story, because you can be gone, and then yeah, that's it, so. Yeah. Also, like, donating to museums, you know, the artifacts that you do have. Like, one of the coolest things of uh, the Chicago Hip Hop History Museum, when they opened, was they started with Soul Train, and they break the story from there, but they had pictures that everyone gave and you know as people were coming some people like oh man i don't see myself on the wall and you know i'm like well did you give them anything and you know Mm. but it being Mm. that simple and seeing it that way of like well i have all this stuff in storage like let's give it real life give it legs i also know that um and i and and most of the times i i speak strictly from the community in which i'm um very very much engulfed in, and that's the house music community with Chicago and the spaces. Um, I just really wish that somewhere along the line we could actually get together and read up on one of the reasons why we don't have these spaces anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't have them anymore because it's illegal to have them now. These spaces were legally by a law shut down. The music box was not a place where they served alcohol. It was a juice bar. The power plant was not a place where they served alcohol. It was a juice bar. The warehouse was not a place where they served alcohol. It was a juice bar. And in the, I wanna say in the 90s maybe? 90, 92. 92, 93, yeah. The rave laws. Yes. Mm. Or the juice bar the ordinance. The juice bar law. Yeah. Well, juice bar ordinance was, was 
kind of grandfathered into the rave laws, but the bigger picture was the rave laws, and the rave laws really had absolutely nothing to do with black and brown people. It was for the preservation of, of the clear people. It was. <laughs> that always makes me laugh inside my body. <laughs> I love it. Go, I'm sorry. It was for the preservation of the suburban kids that were coming into the city of Chicago and going to rave parties. And raves were secret underground parties. And their parents didn't know where they were at 15 and 16 and 17 years old. At 16 years old, I live in the suburbs now, at 16 years old, everybody gets a car. You get a car, and you get a car, and you get, a, you get that driver's license, there's gonna be a car. <clears throat> Those kids started finding out about the rave parties. That was when you could just rent a warehouse somewhere and have a one night party. And the party would go all night it, there was no social media, so there was no social media advertising. Um, it was word of mouth. Party lines. Little, little, yeah. The pagers and stuff. And all these kids would show up and they would punk out and, and, and but there was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of designer drugs. There was this was during the high time of acid and, and, and ecstasy and, and um, but these kids would come back to the suburbs and they'd be on drugs and their parents didn't know that they were and their parents were doctors and lawyers and prominent people in the suburban world, probably working at Rush Hospital or stuff like that, you know, president of, VP of cardiology at you know, and little Johnny has been sneaking back into the city, and little Johnny got a heroin problem, and mom and daddy don't know. All they know is that little Johnny has dramatically changed in his behaviors. And, and, and the clear people were like, that's enough of y'all killing our kids. It wasn't, it was never enough of us being killed off because that's okay. But it was the clear people. So they came down with the rave laws and basically that shut down the ability to have parties for um, in, in, in conventional, unconventional gathering spaces that these kids could come to and potentially get turned out on drugs, trafficking, um, all types of bad things that the clear people kids were falling the victim to. Also a different taste of music all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Hey, why aren't you listening to this yeah. anymore? They, what is they, that? You know, what are you listening to? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, they, were, they were rockers, they were ravers, they listened to, um, and then they teetered over into the acid tracks of dance music and things like that. Um, Music has always been a great enhancement to the high experience, no matter what you're getting high off of. Music is always uh, uh, an enhancement to that. Um, when they came down with the rave laws, it did affect the juice bars, because the juice bars, you didn't have to be 21 years old to get into the music box. You didn't have to be 21 years old. All you had to do was be 18 and be able to stay out past a certain time at night. Curfew has always been 11, 11.30 in the city of Chicago. 10.30 if you were, 10 o'clock if you were under age 16, but, but if you were 18, there was no curfew. So the rave laws cut out a whole bunch of stuff, but the rave laws still exist and we can't have spaces, and it's legal. Well, so, so what, it actually, what the law actually says is that, so a PPA license, a PPA license is a public place of the music license to be able to charge. So how it used to work is um, the time that a place has to close is based on the liquor license, either two o'clock or four o'clock or three o'clock or five o'clock. So if you didn't have a lyrical license, you didn't have to close. So that was the, the, the way it worked. So okay, we won't have a lyrical license, we don't, we don't sell alcohol, 
we can stay open all night long. But what the PPA did said, which said is you had to have a license to be able to charge. And basically, it's almost impossible to have a PPA license without a liquor license. So that's, the, that's, the, that's what they kind of did, basically. So you can't, so that's why there's no tea in clubs, right. because you can't charge to get into a place without having a liquor license. So it's only alcohol right now. It's funny that Chicago, alcohol, and politics still. 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 <laughs> it's, that's it's, that's, no, no. Actually, but, but that's actually, what fuels us. There was, a, uh, there was a girl that went to Medusa's that got on drugs. Her father was an attorney in the North Shore. So he was the main one that was kind of pushing this, this thing to happen. Yeah. And, that, and, and, and literally, that's where the yeah. rave law, act, the yeah. idea for it came from because it was affecting a little clear kid. Yeah. Um, I, I, wanna, <laughs> I wanna move this on because we need to look at the archives and then take questions. But I, I, I gotta say, um, and, and it's coming from a place of experience, some of the best times in this city have been when we have gathered under a little bit of duress. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's when we all came together um, post Reagan era, beginning of the Clinton era, and when hip hop in Chicago really kind of took a turn, when poetry in Chicago took that turn, when house music, when the, when the places all closed, it was like, well, where are we gonna go? And, but people ended up gathering anyway. I think the strength of the people in this city has always been when it's on the line, when it's really part of like, how are we going to do this? We always find a way. I cannot remember a time when we haven't, even during COVID, mm -hmm. even during a, pan a global pandemic, your great grandfather quite possibly could address the last pandemic on earth, but we were in it and we were still making sure people ate. We was making sure people had something to do. We were doing Zooms just to make sure everybody was cool. Just it, we, we've always, and I can't speak for other cities, but I can talk about this one. We've always been on point when it comes to being like, this is the time to act. We gotta act. So I would hope if you take anything out of today, just remember, man, we always, always, when it's time, when it's on the line, we stand up. It's the best thing about being a Chicagoan, outside of the lake. It's the best thing about being a Chicago. We will stand up when we have to stand May up. May I add one sure. thing that I've been like hoping to say before we close out this segment? Um, a part of protecting culture, in my experience, has been being able to make a phone call when I needed to talk to somebody. And when it comes to protecting culture, like culture is a matter of gathering the minds and the hearts and the souls of people and that can be a small circle or it can expand bigger but there's been times I've had to call Maida like can we just talk I've had to call Eric can I need some advice because a part of the culture is like you're passing down your experience and I'm entering a place where I don't know where the hell I'm going or what I'm doing but I need you to help guide so if we can continue to hold on to that and make space and time for each other. When somebody's calling, sometimes we actually like are saving lives. We're saving spaces. We're saving families, you know? And sometimes we're it's saving literally each just, other. we're saving each other. And it's just a phone call. Absolutely. Can we talk? <laughs> I, knew, I knew it was gonna happen at some point that Eric was gonna sing something. So that's what protecting culture also looks like. Yeah. Um, and I can attest to that. I know there have been times where Eric will call me just out of the blue, like, man, I got an idea. And I go, yeah? I'm like, where are you? Ah, oh, that's, that's important. Here's the thing, though. I want to talk to you about it. So, um, I think that, yes, that is, that is really, that, again, back when the COVID time, during the COVID times, the phone didn't stop ringing, and I was glad somebody was calling. And I would be glad to make a phone call to make sure everything was cool. Uh, Jody Presser, hi. We'd like to look at some archival stuff. Who's first? Hey, it's Alexa. There she is. Hey, can somebody turn down the lights? I boy, oh boy. Turn off the lights. <laughs> what in the world? Light a candle. We are in a church. Don't get yourself in trouble. <laughs> turn them off. Turn them off. <laughs> what, are we, what are we watching? So um, uh, this is just a moment captured during um, the Art West gallery tours before I opened a gallery myself. 
that was um, in 2019 before the pandemic. It was the first summer we had gathered and organized three spaces, had maybe over 300 people circulating through three locations. Um, and the very last location, I talked to Corey and I said, Corey, uh, which stop you wanna be? He was like, oh, I gotta be the last stop. It, it gotta be a party. Cause Corey don't play about 345. It's gonna be a good time every time. So um, we talked about who would be spinning cause each space had their own budget. I was able to raise enough so that each space could program based on a number of things that we wanted to have available. So there was food, there was drinks, there was music. And so this was the last stop and people partied and danced and it got so good that women was taking off the shoes. And that's how you know when a party is good when shoes are coming off and people are still dancing on yeah. the concrete slab. That's just <laughs> in the middle of mid snap too. Look at her right hand, she is snapping. Yes, her. she really was, she really was. <laughs> so yes, this is a timeless piece for me. That's awesome. Um, so the other part of the tour was Legendary Art Gallery, um, again, supporting spaces, um, increasing the visibility of spaces. If it's nacho space, it's okay. Like say, hey, y'all need to check this out. So it was really like Legendary Art Gallery um, opened their space and we had some musicians, live music happening. And I, I wanted to capture this because um, again, going back to the creative ecosystem, um, making sure that we support everybody that is a part of the experience. So that means from the photographer to the musicians, to your admin person, your assistant, anyone that has a hand in creating this machine, this Voltron, because that's what we do. We, we are building a Voltron. Every day. And you have to make sure that every component of that machine is taken care of and maintained. So you want people to go home feeling good about, you know, that, that creative energy that they just shared with everyone. So you want to make sure that people are paid. <laughs> but I wanted to capture this moment, you know, because of that reason. And we got some folks, yeah, yeah. And so just seeing people having such a good time, you see all the phones out, um, because they themselves want to capture the moment. And for all of this to happen, on the west side, to me, was very iconic. Um, and I wanted to continue, but the pandemic happened the very next year. So we're hoping to bring this tour back. Um, you know, so we'll be looking for partnerships soon to start building that tour up again. I don't know what song was playing, but Sierra McKissick is in <laughs> it. They were in it. She and is I'm in on the The band and was incredible. It. She is so deep in it. She got headphones on her head, not even listening to them, Jack. She in there. Wait till I see her. But the entire day was just a party, nice. and it was a very blackity black party. That's the best kind. Yeah. Thank you. Pugs Adams. <laughs> what are we about to look at, Pugs Lee? Uh, I think it's a video with sound about uh, Boulevard Art Center. The place that I want to map was a cultural institution in Inglewood in the, the late 80s, early 90s the Boulevard Arts Center. Uh, initially, I started to take painting classes there when I was like in seventh, eighth grade. And at that time they were operating out of a school off like 55th near uh, Racine and Halstead, somewhere in between there. You know, from there, they actually got a building, 6011 Justine, an old Catholic church. And then that became like the headquarters of their programming everything else. I continue with painting classes. I think my teacher was Greg Spears, a uh, really dope painter, figurative painter. I started to take drama as well with uh, Dina Rutledge. That was like my drama teacher. You had uh, Marcus Akalana, you know, doing murals on the building and other programming. You had Lori Go teaching dance. You had the Alayo Dance Company. You had the AACM, Andre Gachard. You had Roman and Maria Villarreal. You had David Philpot. You had David Boykin. You had Milton Meisenberg. You had Dorian Sylvain. You had Mr. Imagination. You had Bob Richards. You had Tyamba Jess. You had Dale Washington. You had Mom Song. You had Maury Cable from Senegal. You had Alan Stringfellow. You had William Carter. You had Willie Carter. You had Melvin King. You had Richard Hunt. 
Margaret Burroughs. He had all these, these artists either teaching, donating art to keep the art center funded or, you know, doing programs or, you know, being a part of the art shows that they had there. And I mean, at this time, this is probably the only place you could really show art in Inglewood in the gallery set. And I mean, they would have all women shows. They would have, you know, uh, I think one time they featured the Negro of Mexico where they went out and took photographs of the just the, the lifestyle of uh, the black Mexicans. Besides, you know, just having all these artists there, I mean, they had a summer program every summer employing the youth of the neighborhood and painting, dance, um, video, poetry, you know, just the, the full gambit of uh, arts and education thing. And I mean, it became actually the blueprint for after school matters. Besides that, I mean, they had uh, uh, their own store where you could buy things made by, you know, artists of the community, you know, painted shoes, painted bags, handmade items, uh, framed artwork, just the whole clothing, just the whole deal, you know, in, in these two spaces. I think the store was like on 61st and Ashland. So it was like, you know, on the main strip. But it was just like all these people were coming together in this space and creating so much. I mean, they had festivals there for the youth and, you know, even like some graffiti luminaries would be there, like Raven and Zora. I learned can control from those guys there at the, one of the festivals that they had. They had movie screenings. You had a totally positive productions throwing talent shows for the neighborhood. You have rappers coming from all over the city, singers coming from all over the cities, just, you know, to get a, a place, a chance. I mean, I threw my first ever, you know, party concert there, you know, in, in that space. They would let you uh, use the church and you could just move the pews out the way and, you know, set up your, your performance. I started to to teach eventually there. I was teaching like a, a preschool kindergarten art class on Saturdays and, you know, being a docent, you know, for the gallery shows, learning how to frame art, learning how to hang art and then, you know, perfecting my, my practice within the classes and then getting, you know, those critiques from these artists that are in the field, you know, were, were invaluable. The push, you know, with Patricia Devine Reed, executive director and founder, my mom, Marty Price, artistic director there, just really were in all angles trying to figure out how to activate the community and then bring things to the community that were needed, but also things that could empower, you know, the youth there. And, you know, as I, as I think back to it, like, Man, like, when else could you get all those people in one space? I mean, you couldn't even do that now. Some of those people have passed away, et cetera. But just all that power, you know, in, in one space is amazing. And for it to be in Inglewood is a testament, you know, of community, of, you know, where the arts really lie. You know, it's not necessarily in this glossy place. It's just in any space where people are pushing for culture. Wow, to be a part of that, to see that. It, it definitely changed me and it really made me see you could create what you want to see where you're at. You don't have to go anywhere to create it. You could create it where you are. That is brilliant. Thank you. By the way, Dale's son, Masaja, is doing an exhibit of his dad's work called A Conversation with Dale Washington at the Bridgeport Art Center. I think it starts this week. Uh, I had Masaja on my show. We talked a lot about Dale. Seeing that, it does not surprise me at all that Dale Washington was in the middle of all of that. But see, for me, like all those artists, yeah. those were my art homes. Right. So it was very weird coming back <laughs> to kids my age. Man, right. They're doing it, you yeah. know. Th that, that's an amazing. I could watch that again. That was dope, Puzz. Yeah. Thanks. That was for the Chicago Park District uh, to map cultural institutions around Chicago. Nice. Uh, there you go. <laughs> go <ahead. laughs> work. All right. Hey. Basically, the Nakarat thing came from me trying to start. No, uh, you can stop that. it. That oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, because it's, it's another long video. Yeah. It's so I'm, um, I'm still mad I don't have one of those pugs. I mean, they're available. I don't they have one. They are available. <laughs> but um, 
in the sense of mapping places and you know telling our history. So for the cover of my last album, I did a, a large scale painting of Dr. Wax, and the people in the front often would have this same look of like, in this picture specifically, he's playing her some music on a Walkman, but you'd be waiting for your friends because there's no cell phones, and this is like a central, again, safe place to meet up. But Dr. Wax was like an institution for music, and for a lot of us, that was like how we were able to pay our rent. I mean, I could go there every two weeks, they'll give me 100 bucks for 10 CDs, you know? And so many artists we would get put on, you know, with, from Dwayne, from Taiwan Davis that was working there. And I mean, the whole staff just was so knowledgeable about what was going on. And then also the flyers and posters in the window told you, you know, what you needed to see. And then, you know, as well with the staff telling you what you need to hear. I've, I've only gramophone, it's probably the only other place I've ever seen where somebody could tell somebody what stack of records to get. And they honor that and don't feel away, you know, about it. So it was just my home watch to the old High Park and, you know, the oh, culture that was there. Um, before we, we, we play Eric's thing real quick, Dr. Wax, I've had Dwayne look at me like he was about to kill me because I had a record, he was like, don't buy that. Many times, he don't buy that to me. And my record collection is dope because of that dude. Hey, it's Eric Williams from Silver Room. Look at that. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but... Uh, yeah, so I, I, I went to UIC. And um, because I was at UIC, this is back in 90, 89, whatever it was, a long time ago. Um, I started going out to Maxwell Street, down the street, south of Roosevelt before it changed. And so I started buying stuff and I started going back to UIC, reselling it. And my uncle, he sold uh, tools there. Um, I'm not sure where he got them from, but he <laughs> sold tools. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. For those of you who know Maxwell Street, everything, everything was sold there. You, you, he was resourceful. You can't even say, because, because of where we're at hands. right now in this house, that I won't say some things that were sold there, but everything was sold on Maxwell Street. So I met this guy from the Nation of Islam. He started, uh, he said, hey, you should sell these t-shirts. You can make money selling t-shirts. So I was selling uh, Bart Simpson t-shirts and Batman t-shirts. Anyway, long story short, that's how I got into selling was because of Maxwell Street. So I kept going down there. So this is years I was selling stuff, socks, you name it. And then I, and they would have records down there also. So I would buy crates of records. You could buy a crate of records for like $10. So I just started buying crates of records. I bought a crate, didn't even look at what it was. I just looked at a couple of them. I saw some of the lab labels. It was a bunch of uh, 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 West End records were in there, which was my favorite record label. I took it home, started going through the crate of records and it was Ron Hardy's crate. And then I opened it up, I looked at it, I saw this slip mat. And it was the slip mat from the music box for US Studio. It was Ron Hardy's slip mat. I bought this crate of records for like literally five or ten dollars. And so part of me, I was like, oh, this is kind of dope. And Reggie Corner has a if you know Reggie Corner, he's a promoter. He has a photo of him and Ron Hardy with the slip mat in the in the photo. And part of me was like, oh, this is dope. I have this piece of history that I have. I, it's actually on my wall in my house. But other part of me was kind of sad that this man who was so important to our culture died and he sold his records for little or nothing and I bought a crate of his records for $10 and found a slip mat. So anyway, that's what that is. Um, this was, it was Stacy. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, but um, this was uh, the photo from the stage at the last block party in Hyde Park. And um, wow. I see the joy in people's faces, but Mario knows I was not happy. I was probably the, I was probably the least happy person there that day. I've never seen him with that look on his face before. I was, was like it so was a horrible day. <laughs> no, I was just over it. I was over this party. It was like it was you know everybody's having a good time. I'm like spending so much money and so many people. It was hot, oh. and I was just like ready to go. It, it was, was so hot. yeah. It was hot. the hottest day of the year. And then it got to a point where I was like, man, this is not what I was trying to do. This was a party for like. 100 people. Now it's a party for 40,000 people. And so, you know, I was just really <laughs> not happy that day. But then I go back later and see these photos. I'm like, you know, everybody was having a good time. So maybe there's some joy that, that I have to kind of like see the faces and have to get some sort of meaning from that. So that's why I like this photo.
So uh, this uh, song was is was is still very important to me because I think it was the first song where I like really 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 like got the music. You know when that's when that song comes on, you hear that dee -dee -dee, you know then do 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 do. You're like oh you know it was like that was it for me. You know um, and so yeah it, it was a it, I'd been buying albums before this, but I feel like this was an album that was probably one of the most important songs. Um, that really made me just fall in love with the, the culture and the music even more so. It was, it was 84, Celeste? Mm-hmm. Um, 80, 80, yeah. You all might have 83, 84. 84. I think I first heard it in maybe 83. 83, yeah. So I was 13 in 83. So I was a kid. You know, you look back now, you're like, these are 13-year-olds, you know? But it was like, man, this song just meant everything to me. I'm 13. Eric, only 23. Keep telling y'all. Born 1970. Um, anyway, that's the photo from the block party. And that's yeah, that is the right, block party go. with Pete Rock, yeah. as a matter of fact. And I think Pete was on stage when that picture was taken. Um, that, thank y'all for those wonderful. <laughs> Before we take questions from everybody, I, I do need to speak just briefly about that last block party. We couldn't get. AVR Young is playing on a stage on Harper. We were on 53rd, which would be right in front of the High Park Bank building. I couldn't get from the High Park Bank building to 53rd and Harper. I couldn't get to the Silver Room, and it was a half a block down. There had never been that many people together on 53rd Street, ever. Even when it was a township, they never had 40,000 people on 53rd Street. It was such a, a dramatic change in how the block party was from being in Wicker Park to being in Hyde Park that it, it was overwhelming to see that many people and on stage holding the microphone and trying to keep 40,000 people cool when it was a billion degrees outside was quite the task. And then having your friend, your dear friend, Eric Williams, walk up to you and look at you and go, they got to stop playing, was the most painful thing I have ever heard in my life. Because as an artist, I don't want them to stop playing. I want them to finish. But I'm looking at what he's looking at. And it's getting later and later. And it's like, you got to tell them to stop. And then he was just so angry that day. I was like, ooh, I've never, I've known Eric a long time. He's probably the happiest black man I've ever met. He scared me that day. I was like, we got to never do this again. <laughs> and then COVID happened and we didn't do it. I was like, dang, COVID. You, you messed up the opportunity for me to see him mad twice. But the best thing that ever happened to Hyde Park was his block party. So I, I will never forget how much fun it was to be doing, to have a gig so close to the crib but man, it just, it, the neighborhood is not structurally built for 40,000 anything. Yeah. People were all time. in our blocks, all in our blocks. It was parking crazy. lot pimping, car pimping. My DJ Nobody, didn't make it to my set because he right, couldn't get he through. Couldn't get through. Yeah. Nobody expected crazy. that. No. Absolutely nobody expected that. It was crazy. I almost lost was, my job because of the block party. It almost, <laughs> almost just, it was hot. It was so hot. The and I think I got an attitude with you, Eric, about that because you put, you put me in an indoor venue <laughs> to play. <laughs> I remember this story. But thank you for saving my life See? because it was boiling. I hot. hate the heat like that. I was like, thank you for putting me in an air conditioned indoor venue. I was so angry with you. <laughs> I wanted to be on the main stage. I wanted to be out and <laughs> the, uh, the, he saved my life that day. <laughs> the first block party, my boss, who I won't say his name, challenged me and said 5,000 people won't be in Hyde Park. And I just looked at him because we did the last one in Wicker Park and it was about maybe 10 or 20,000 people. Yeah. And I said, you're crazy. I almost lost my job because we got into a fight fight. Almost physical fight, but a long argument about how many people were going to show up. I said, I will bet your check for a month. I will bet your salary for a month that 5,000 people show up. We had about 11,000 people at Block Party, the first one at Hyde Park. And he never questioned anything about the Block Party ever again. So, all right, it's time to take questions from our 
studio audience. Does anyone have a question? Anyone? Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll narrow it down to one. Okay, I'll, I'll ask one. You can't see the wireless. Um, going back to the space conversation, because y'all peeped, like, that was what I was very curious about when I was coming in. Um, you talked about, I'm sorry. Okay, oh, word, okay. Y'all talked about, I, I'm thinking of, I, I'm thinking of a couple things right now. We're talking about, like, the virtues of, like, inf informal spaces. Um, the necessity for for resources in order to build capacity to actually like hold a movement, um, and I f I forget what the third thing is. I want to ask just like moving forward, like if you I I feel like you guys have like a pulse on what's happening right now because somebody asked that question earlier about like is there another house music movement happening and you said yeah. Um, I'm thinking specifically about the post, that venue, if you guys were up on that, I think it was on like 61st and it got shut down, kind of reminiscent of the rave laws and like the juice bar and things that you guys were talking about. Um, like, I'm just throwing that out there. If that jogs any thoughts for you guys, I don't think that I'm gonna be able to like really, really boil this question down, but but just those ideas. Well, so, it, so, yeah. Hey, and, and, and I, I was literally at that set last night. Yeah. So the future of people playing and continuing the furtherance of it is sitting right next to you and people like it. it it's the space part. I will, I'm not trying to be on this panel. I'm just saying the space part of it is it's the resourcefulness of you being able to say this is where we're going to make this is where we're going to make this happen on this space. The Silver Room Block Party started in an alley on Milwaukee. Eric had, I'm telling Eric's story for him. Eric had cords run up to his house. He called all his people that he knew that would come. And Ron Trent and Eric, Silver Room Block Party doesn't happen without them having this conversation about let's have a party. It's the space, you, you make the space wherever it is, where your feet are is the space. Yeah, like Promontory Point. After I threw that party in Inglewood, Promontory Point became my party headquarters. It was $50 to rent per hour. And I mean, I pushed it until they're like, you can't throw parties anymore. But so many of us got to use it. And then every Tuesday, all the dancers would come. Every Thursday would be break uh, graffiti writers and rappers. But taking hold and ownership, and then also those people that ran it looked and like, well, we have youth programs, but the kids are just coming here regardless of that. So then they started to focus more on how to help us make the events happen. But you really got to create your space. Yeah. When you start talking about spaces, um, there's a word that usually comes behind before space, and it's safe. Um, and when I talk about safety, I'm not just talking about um, environmental safety, um, being in a safe neighborhood, not having fear of being, you know, held up or whatever the case may be, jacked, you know, snatched off the streets or anything like that. But we have to think about the spaces themselves. Um, you talked about the post. Um, and as you talk about the post, we can talk about the lodge as well. We need to make sure that when we're bringing people into spaces, that the spaces are literally safe. Chicago had an incident years ago, and there's another law as a result of that incident. The E2, what happened at E2? What a lot of people don't know is, is that E2 was many, many clubs before it was E2. La Mirage, Heroes. It started off as La Mirage, it, and then it turned into Heroes, and then it turned into The Click, and then it turned into, but the owner of that space, who bought that space, that used to be a, a, a Ford dealership. Leslie Motors. Leslie Motors. It was the Haitian Relief Center for it was, a while. It was, a, and La Mirage 
was on the first floor, but that second floor they soon opened. The man that owned it, I don't, I don't want to say his name, but the man that owned it, he owned it through all of those clubs, all the way through E2 when the tragedy, tragedy happened and those people died. I started, I was one of the first residents when he first opened that, when it was La Mirage. And the fire department and the police consistently over decades would shut down that second floor because that second floor was not safe. They were code violations. That's how come every time they shut that place down, it resurfaced with another name because the code violations would constantly get them shut down. That second floor was not safe. It wasn't stable and there weren't enough ways to get out of that space. The DJs literally, they had us up 200 feet up in the air on a catwalk yes, DJ they when they first opened up that place. It wasn't until they became heroes that they actually built a DJ booth on the second floor. And the second floor was still not deemed safe. But he kept throwing parties there. The post, the post is not a safe space. It's an old, dilapidated building that has all types of code violations and people should not be partying up in there. I went up in there one time, Joe Clausel, just be the, the very day before they shut everything down for the pandemic, they had Ron Trent and Joe Clausel up in there and it was 500 people and that floor could have collapsed because it definitely was swaying. <laughs> We're lucky we made it out of there safe. So the post, he knew that that was not a safe space. The lodge. The lodge is an old building, dilapidated, that had structural damage on it from the time that it was open. That's not Craig Loftus' first time being there. It was on another side. And he rationalized, or they rationalized, that if we had it on this side, that we could continue to have parties here. But structural damage is structural damage. And just because they say the structural damage is on the left side of the building doesn't mean that you can still party on the right side of the building. That's why they got shut down. So we have to be mindful in where and how we care for our own safety, our own security, each other, when we're presenting spaces like this. Ordinances suck, but, but they're, they're there for a reason, you know? Um, so that was just to speak to what you were saying about the post. Was the environment and the vibe everything? Yes, it most definitely was. Was the sound system the bomb? It most definitely was. But we could have had an E2 situation or worse at any given moment, every time. And I refused to play in that space. In fact, the one time I went, I went in, I, went, I was at that pandemic party, I refused to ever go inside that, that building again because it scared me, because it was unsafe and it felt unsafe. You've been inside? Did you feel safe? Oh. Okay, I, 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 that's all I want to know. <laughs> all right. Like, right, but uh, that's all yeah. I want to know. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about spaces, always remember that word in front of it, safe spaces. That's how I feel right. about the Congress Theater. Like, I would hate yeah. doing shows there. Congress you didn't was know how it was going to go. scary as hell. All right, so I want to talk about the numbers and the business side of space, right? So it's, it's it, to me, it, it's simple in many ways, right? You buy a space, you rent a space, it costs a certain set amount of money. A space now is gonna cost you, a decent sized space is gonna cost you a million dollars. This is what it's gonna cost. Or a half a million, you gotta fix it up. So you're gonna put, to, to, to a nice, not a lodge or a, a nice space, it's a million dollars, right? You talk about putting a sound system in, a nice sound system that we talked about, like how most people actually, I, th I think if you're under 
35 or 40 have never really heard a nice sound system in Chicago, a real sound system. Sonotech. Sonotech was, was Sonotech. nice, yeah. One of the best sound right, and now it closed in 2008. Yeah. 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 Right, so that could be, you know, Joe, uh, Joe from uh, Smart Bar told me he spent 200,000 on Smart Bar sound system. Long story short, it's money. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying is, we talk about building a quality space. It costs a whole bunch of money. Period. There's no cheap. There's no way around it. So that's number one. Number two, as artists, people want to get paid, right? So you have to pay the DJ, pay blah 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 blah. So these are the expenses. Now, how do you make the money? Two main ways you make money from nightclubs is you charge a cover charge, which nowadays no one wants to pay anymore. Everybody wants to be on the guest list. Twenty dollars, thirty dollars. This is my boy. This is my girl. Hook me up, or you're selling alcohol. That's how you actually make money, right? So what happened is, especially in the early uh, '90s, when when downtown spaces were cheap, you could live. I mean, West Loop was not West Loop. It was, you know, Derek Carter had a space over there for five hundred dollars off of Green. I mean, you know, it was cheap. So now these spaces become valuable. So now you're talking about, you know these investors spending money for these, these spaces, from a business standpoint, if you got 2,000 square foot feet of a, a dance floor, does it make more sense to have it be a dance floor where people are dancing and drinking water, or is bottle service? Right. From a business standpoint, which one makes more sense? Mm -hmm. You're gonna sell $500 of liquor. That's what started to happen. So everyone started to sell liquor, so the, the culture of dance disappeared mm -hmm. because the people who own these spaces weren't about the culture of dance. They were about trying to, it was a business decision. So that's what happened, basically. So now we fast forward. Now there's no place to go dance. Well, you can't make money at a dance club, basically. And Joe would tell you the same thing. I mean, Smart Bar does okay, but he has Metro. You know, there's very few places that are just dedicated to just a dance culture because there's no money in it. I mean, it's as simple as that. I hate to say it that way, but that's actually you know why. When you talk about space, you know, you have to. Um, if you want to create a culture, I mean, Mario knows the block party was never an idea to make money. I mean, I never made money from block party. It wasn't about that, you know. But who's now, in 2024, going to invest a whole bunch of money in a space for people to dance and drink water from a business standpoint? That's why we don't have anything, so. And even um, to add to that, because um, I'm now working with, for collaboration um, as resident um, with Rebuild Foundation now. And um, we were just talking about Sunday service. Um, Sunday service, and a lot of people are probably just figuring out or finding out about Sunday service. But Sunday service is a program that Dwayne Powell started eight years ago. Nobody uh, and nobody was coming. Um, and Rebuild Foundation is a 501c3. So being a non-for-profit, they just figured, well, we can't make no profit. We got to give it away for free. Sunday service tomorrow is actually has a suggested donation now um, because last Sunday service, 900 people showed up. 900 people in a garden. This is Kenwood Gardens. The capacity for Kenwood Gardens is 600, and that was 900 with RSVP. That's not even including the people that never RSVP'd. So they had to figure out a way to put certain controls around it. So it's not that the desire to be there and the word of mouth has not spread to people want to come and experience, have these experiences with this one particular um, program and event. Everybody wants to do it, but we, unfortunately became a culture of free. Um, and that came out of necessity because once, once the juice bars set down, shut down and we didn't have those spaces, we started going into lounges. We started going into the family den. We started going into Leo's den. We started going into Reynolds. We started going into the South Side mom and pop taverns and bars and having parties. Well, in all honesty, none of those places, first of all, they can't charge to get in, even though they sell alcohol. They cannot charge to get in. They don't have the PPA license. Not only do they not have the PPA license, we're not supposed to be dancing in there without a cabaret license. 
PPA and cabaret license. A cabaret license is the license to actually dance in a venue. Um, so if you haven't noticed, most of those little spots don't have a dance floor or they didn't have a dance floor. Family Den has a dance floor now. They got the licensing to do that after they shut down and revamped some things. But what's that next to the Family Den? The, the dating game, no, what was that? What's the, is that the dating game that's totally shut down? Yep. The dating game never opened back up. So we, we are challenged with a whole lot of different things, both legally, zoning, um, and we got used to this free culture because we started taking our music into lounges and crowns and spaces where you can't dance, but we play dance music. But you know, also too, you know, the people who are going to these nightclubs and spending a thousand dollars, you know, on alcohol are not dancers for the most part. You know what I mean? Uh, they're, so not, they're not out of the house music community neither. I'm sorry. Right. They're right. not from the house so, music community neither. Right. So, the, the, no, the spaces are going to cater to the people spending the money. Exactly. And, right. and, and they have no choice but to do that. And the people that are not spending the money are going to continue to go to spaces that we ain't supposed to be in the first place. And then they get upset when you got to pay to get in. And that's well, the problem is people don't want to pay. And that, well, that's, that's the moral of the story. Yeah. People got to pay. If we want to keep our culture going, you got to pay something. And people don't, you know, pe yeah. we want our friends to be paid as DJ, blah, blah, but then somehow we don't want to pay somehow. So how's this work? But the donation box is always full. It's empty. I, I bet you tomorrow, we, uh, we, we should ask Ellen, uh -oh. how many people will actually donate tomorrow? Um, I would no, bet you'd no, be no, less no, no, than no. a third. Entry was a $10 suggested, and they did it through Eventbrite. And as of the time that I talked to Ellen about it two weeks ago, they already had raised over $2,000 with the $10 and they'll say suggested donation to get your Eventbrite ticket. Also, and, and the Eventbrite ticket is on a sliding scale. So suggested is $10, but you could give a dollar and still get a ticket. Also, you can't get in without a ticket now because 900 people showed up to a space that we can only hold 600 in. So we had to find a way to narrow it down with attendance St so it, everybody could still enjoy it, but also try to get some way for to make it try to pay for itself. Because every time they have a Sunday service, it does. It costs a lot of money for that production, you know. And the donation box that's out there, I count that donation box every single time. And yeah, we might raise about five. $600 in donations, people. So but with that donation, it makes me understand that even on a free basis, people are willing to pay for their entertainment. All we gotta do is ask. I gotta stop Look. you. Uh -oh. It's over, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really know how to end it. It's just, it's thank over. you everybody, thank you for coming. <laughs> everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to Alexi, Pugs, Celeste, Eric, Kahari, the panelists earlier. Thank you all. This church is important, and we got to make sure that we, we, we always tell people that we had a chance to hang out where Dr. King hanged out when he was yeah. in Chicago. So thank you all for coming. That's right. <laughs>